Welcome back to the channel, doing a video today, not technically a podcast, but as a board certified obesity medicine physician, I was very interested when Greg Doucette to posted a video, let's, let's tax the fat people. Yeah, I'm very excited to react to this one. Uh, I'm a tax enthusiast, so let's see what he has to say. This is absolutely ridiculous. Solid hook. Coach Greg, in today's video, there's a country that actually taxes the people for being fat. And I'm not making this shit up, and it's been going on for several years. You probably didn't know this. I certainly did. So we're going to talk about, does this make sense? Does it actually work? And should they do it in North America? This country taxes people for being too fat, and the results are actually quite shocking. So this country introduced a fat tax that forced every business to take mandatory waste measurements of their employees every year. And so first things first, they're going to tax the employer as it this is interesting uh reaction to a reaction video so i guess he's also reacting to someone this um, is like three layers of inception yeah here. it's some inception um somewhat controversial they introduced a fat tax uh, apparently a business tax to take mandatory waste measurements of its employees every year so probably don't want to have gh gut um, even if you're lean, if the employee does not make any improvements, the business would be fined. More taxes on businesses. That sounds like what we need. Sounds like if this happened in North America, people would be fudging some numbers. Like, oh, that's a nice 32 inch waist you've got there, John. Yeah. The boss of the employees for them being fat. How is it my responsibility? If you're a boss and you have workers and they decide to eat too many cheeseburgers, then why am I being the one that's held accountable? And so to me, that doesn't make sense. You want to tax the people. I would agree with this. Uh, maybe we could turn this up to two times or 1.5 times speed, too. Good thought. Um, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, you don't want to be held, you don't want to be hiring your employees for their um, waste measurement. If that's the metric they go by, you want to hire them by merit. Then, you know, that's, that's that. Yeah, just because you have a small waist doesn't mean you're good at your job. Who are overweight and obese, well, let's talk about that. But why are we taxing the employer? The limits were 33.5 inches for men and 35.4 inches for women. Next, these numbers make absolutely no sense. Where do they come up with these? Men have to have a waist below 33.5 inches. And women, we're going to let them have a waist size of 35.4 inches. How does that make sense? Why is it that women who are shorter, smaller, and lighter allowed to have a bigger belly than men? That, that to me is ridiculous. And use your logic, your thinking gaps. Is it not more normal for a man to have a large waist than a woman? I mean, really look around. If I told you that I had a 34-inch waist, would you think that I'm fat? So raise your hand if you think my waist is over 33.5 inches. Remember, if you're over 33.5, you're going to get an extra tax. And I, by the way, have approximately 8% body fat. Clearly, I'm not obese. But is my waist above 33.5 inches? Well, let's see. Right, I'm going to go around the belly button just to see. And 34.5 inches. And so that company would be taxed. But if I suck in my stomach, 31.5 inches. So depending on if I'm breathing out or breathing in, it's going to give you two totally separate measurements. How yeah, obviously, everybody's going to suck in their stomach here. Yeah. It's like when you stand up trying to get your height measured, you stand up as tall as possible. It sounds like Greg Doucette is not enjoying what he's going to have to do with his move to Japan that he's playing for. I think this is just definitely a thing he's putting out there to try and put pressure on the Japanese government to take away the law so he can live there. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, I'm not really sure what his angle is yet. Raise your hand. Think the employer is going to give an accurate waist size measurement, knowing that if it's above 33.5 inches, they're going to have to pay extra taxes. Like, really think about it. And remember this. If you're six foot six, you're very tall, and your waist is only 33.5 inches. That is a very tiny, very small waist. But if you're only five feet tall, and your waist is 33.5 inches, then that's a lot. It's quite big. And so the taller you are, the larger the measurement should be. And on average, men are about five inches taller than women. And so why is it that women are allowed to have a larger waist than that of a man? Makes no sense. And imagine you walk around, start measuring people, getting the measuring tape out, body shaping goes on. Everyone at work is pointing a finger. That person had chips, beer, pizza, and so on. And so you're going to get fat shamed. The employers are not going to want to hire anyone who's overweight. Think of it. If you show up to a job interview and I see that you're 50 pounds overweight, do you really think I'm going to hire you? How is that going to be fair to the employees? There's no way you're going to hire someone if they're overweight, if you know it's going to cost you more money than somebody's underweight. And anyone who breached these numbers was required to go to weight loss classes funded by the employer. And so think of it. It's funded by the employer. How is it the employer's fault? Why is it my fault as the boss that my employees are not in shape? I literally have 3,000 videos. Yeah, he's probably not taking into account that people in Japan will work 16 hours a day. So if you're at your workplace all the time and your workplace doesn't have uh, treadmill desks or desks on bicycles or, you know, a gym. vending machines full of candy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you if you work a 32 hour work week, 
I could say, yeah, you know, uh, I agree. It's not really your workplace's fault at all. But if you're working 80 to 90 hour work weeks, then it probably is uh, similar to a lot of physicians that work in the hospital, 80, 90 hours a week. And what the physician's lounge is stocked with, the quality and quantity of food and the caloric density of it, that's going to make a difference uh, as it made a difference for me in residency. <laughs> Yeah. And the point about the male and female waist size differences, that females can actually tolerate a higher body fat percentage and more, you know, adipose tissue, abdominal adipose tissue specifically than men, they're going to tend to get less visceral fat. So that's probably where this discrepancy comes in. You know, why can women have bigger waists and not be you know, penalized or not have their company penalized? That would be sort of my knee jerk reaction, but I'd have to look at kind of what their analysis was that came to the conclusion of this is the metric we have. Mm -hmm. And I try to help the world in order how to lose weight. I have cookbooks, a circle diet book, helping people how to lose weight and keep it off for the rest of your life. But if they choose to ignore everything, they don't do 150 minutes of cardio a week, they don't eat healthy, don't lift weights, then why am I to blame? This is absolutely ridiculous. Also, if companies couldn't reduce the number of overweight employees by certain thresholds each year, they would be subject to fines. The companies are getting fined because their employees are eating burgers? Like, really? Like, how does any of this make sense? Why is it the companies that are in charge of this? Why don't we just blame the school teachers? Well, they go to school and any kid that's overweight, the teacher has to do burpees. Does that make sense? Think about it, people. And while this law doesn't make obesity illegal, it can isolate you from everyone else at work. And so it doesn't make obesity illegal, but imagine you're at work and you're the only one that's overweight. Only 4% of people in this country are overweight. Every country is different, and in particular in this country, they value being thin. And also your managers would be punished if you didn't make any progress, which could cause a lot of mental stress. And imagine you're a manager at a job, and rather than helping the staff, the workers be the best workers they can be, you're focused primarily on, are they eating in a calorie deficit? Are they doing cardio? And you might be thinking, well, yeah. It's hard to say how much this tax is. He hasn't mentioned uh, it could be a negligible amount. So it could just be something that's instituted to put more cultural pressure on the business to create a good health environment. Businesses tend to only respond to things that directly affect their cash flow. So if it's a negligible amount and um, the businesses might really not care about it too much, but the employees might care about it enough just because they don't want to be uh, part of the out group, if you will. Yeah, it definitely could be the work culture there. And there's definitely a different like value on being thin. Like the video said, if only 4% of people are overweight in Japan, contrast that with 70 plus percent in growing in the United States, just two very different cultures. Yeah. And um, what's, what's acceptable and what's not. It's a good thing that Gillette Health is not in Japan, given our winter bulking regimen. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely getting close to that. Uh, 34 inch cutoff. Good, they should be encouraging them. But why is it their job? Why isn't it parents and the kids at school? And if anything, why isn't it not just on that person? Why are we passing the blame, passing the buck? Oh, you're overweight, we're gonna punish your boss. Oh, you're not doing well, it's the teacher's fault. It's the parents. Why can't it be on the person that's not doing what they're supposed to do? And the goal of this policy was to reduce the obesity rate by 25%. And as of today, the country's nationwide obesity rate is only 4%, making this policy a huge success. And so this country, which I'm gonna spoil it right now, it's in, in fact Japan, they have the lowest obesity rate in the world. And so did this law actually work? Well, based on this, I would say yes. But at what cost? And do we want to copy them? Do we want to do the same? Do you agree with this? Knowing that it could work, does that mean that we should implement it? Or could there be something different? Is there not a better way of going about getting the design? Yeah, we should definitely not have this law. But we should have an emphasis on healthy body composition rather than waist size. Uh, and we've mentioned this in previous po podcasts, although this is not a podcast, I guess. But <laughs> um, uh, something like a DEXA scan is a much better marker of overall health. What a waist size is trying to get at is if you have that, um, you know, the android obesity or the abdominal adiposity. Mm -hmm. well, we, apple the, shape. Yeah, yeah, apple shape. VAT is one of the main measures for that. That's your visceral adipose tissue. And in general, you want to have less than one pound unless you're Harvard that says the average is 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 10% of your body fat is visceral per Harvard. Uh, yeah. Clearly, that's not accurate. And I think... Correcting for height is something that's easily done. I believe there is a like height to waist ratio that you don't want to exceed. Maybe I think it's one to two, something like that, mm. um, that's used in obesity medicine as kind of a, a budget way to look at abdominal adiposity. Yep. So certainly not looking at someone who's you know, quite tall like yourself and saying, hey, your waist isn't 28 inches. What the heck? Because some people have genetically wider waists, mm. um, narrower waists. Uh, and I think you know, Greg understands this coming from a bodybuilding background. You yep. know, waist size is a big fixture there. Yep. Uh, waist size is a big fixture in open but bodybuilding. Can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine the earnings calls from companies? No. It, let's say we did put this law into effect, mm -hmm. right? You're talking about you have this much net profit, this percent of year over year growth, you had this new revenue stream, and the average waste of your employees is this. 
And then the stock just tanks because they know that that company is going to get taxed into oblivion because all these engineers have a waist that's over 34 inches. It would be entertaining. It would be. Maybe they should make it a TV show, not a law. That sounds like a better idea. Businesses can volunteer and then depending on how they do, they can get um, whatever reality TV shows give these days. Yeah. A, a surprise marriage or something. <laughs> <laughs> Then forcing companies, employers, bosses to measure the waist size of their employees and then forcing these people to perhaps lose the weight or else they're going to have an extra tax. You have to go to health and fitness classes provided by the employer. Do you really think that's going to make a difference? Oh, I have five, five employees that are overweight and so I have to now pay $100 an hour for all of them to go and attend some fitness class. And do you think that's going to work? Of course not. Do you really think you can out-exercise a bad diet? Do you really think that attending some fitness class is going to ensure that they're going to lose weight? Absolutely. We've actually talked about this topic many times before. Exercise does not help with weight loss, but it very well might help with losing inches from your waist if you're measuring peri-umbilical distance. Um, and it is protective against a lot of the downsides of carrying a high body weight. So individuals who are obese or have a higher class, uh, previously known as morbid obesity, mm -hmm. um, they are certainly much healthier if they exercise. So if your goal is health, which presumably the goal of this program is, then um, that is an ideal intervention. Yeah, I mean, to say, okay, your BMI hasn't come down, but you have you got your 10,000 steps per day? Uh, and there are some aspects of this with, you know, usually it's health insurance carriers where they're looking at, you know, do these healthy behaviors and save money uh, rather than penalizing people. Although I guess you could say it's a penalty for people who aren't participating in the healthy behaviors. Yep. So the takeaway from people listening is not that you shouldn't exercise uh, because this obesity medicine doctor said it does not help you lose weight. Um, <laughs> the goal here is to lose body fat for individuals who have too much body fat and uh, exercise does help you do that. And yeah. it helps you keep the, it helps reset a, a set point. Again, everybody needs a movement pastime to last a lifetime. That's what you find in common with people that lose weight. The two to 5% of people that lose weight and do keep it off, almost all of them have that in common. Yeah, and unless you are a, professional athlete or going to the Olympics, you probably cannot outrun your bad diet. So I totally agree with what Greg says here. Um, and for those people who are elite athletes, you can't keep eating that way after you retire. Yep. That is a good summary. Oh, you go to a fitness class, you're lifting weights. What do you do? Burn 300 calories in an hour. Perhaps you do some more advanced cardio. Burn four, 500 calories. That is not enough. You can get home, eat a cheeseburger, you eat more than 500 calories. And so it is not going to work. To lose the weight, you have to want it. You have to educate people, inform them how to do it, and they have to then want it. And so in 2008, Japan introduced the Metabol Law. Sounds like a metabolism. All men and women aged 40 to 74 have to have their waist measured by their employer on an annual basis. Anyone who breached these figures is required to attend weight loss classes funded by the employer's health insurance company. So think of it, this only applies to people between the ages of 40 and 74. And so if you're 39, you can be as fat as you want. Turn 40, nope, it's all over from there. If you show up to a job interview, 30 different people, and they see that you're on the cusp, you're a little bit overweight, perhaps not quite above the limit. Do you really think they're gonna consider you for that job when they have 29 other candidates who are not obese? And remember, only 4% of the country is actually overweight. In comparison, to the United States, 69%. And in case you're wondering, 36% are obese. And so when I say that somebody is overweight, I'm clearly speaking about most people. On average, the majority of people are overweight. And so if I say in a video, I guess a person's overweight, I'm actually playing the odds. The odds are you watching this at home, you're overweight. Some of you, about one third, are probably obese. And it wasn't always like this, but it has been getting worse year after year. People are doing far less exercise, they're eating worse, and they're scrolling on their... We've talked about this quite a bit as well. Um, the Healthy People 2030 goals, um, which are very reasonable. And uh, there are definitely public health programs that are being initiated to help with this problem. But uh, as with anything in medicine, this is just a phenomenon of uh, each individual family unit or uh, tight knit social unit, if you will, people tend to get the same habits. And the lifestyle changes are driving this in general, it is not, um, you know, it's the six pillars or seven pillars of health. It's not that, um, you know, they're uh, missing something or there's something in the environment that's causing this or genetic switches are switched on by microchips or whatnot. <laughs> um, it's, it's the six pillars. They're watching TV, sitting at home. They're not going out anymore. It was even worse during that time period when you couldn't get out of your house. You know, they shut the gyms down as if that made sense. So yeah, let's try to encourage people to be healthy, but let's prevent them from going to the gym. A number of patients when other people were putting on their COVID 30 pounds, I think that was about the average yep. for the 2020 to 2022 timeframe, uh, that actually took that time to 
get on a regular exercise regimen. They had more time because they were working remotely and they actually significantly improved their health and you know, maybe they lost to COVID-30. And so I don't know the perfect solution, but what I do know is that with education and knowledge comes power. If you inform people how to lose weight and get in shape and you start this at a young age, it will change the mindset, the culture of our nation. As it is right now, people don't give a shit. I'm sorry, they do not. We promote binge eating. We say it's cool. Go to a buffet. All you can eat. We celebrate every Friday. It's somebody's birthday, birthday cake. Eat more. Celebrate with food. Oh, you did great. Here's a reward. Here's more candies. Rather than having the mindset that exercise is cool and that we can have fun by being active, that is not what we promote. And so obviously, my cookbooks, my circle diet book, how to lose weight, keep it off. The solution to getting rid of Japan's Metabo Law, the anabolic cookbook, a cookbook for more food to celebrate food more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I think what he's trying to get at here is that it is not that you should avoid food and become anorexic and become an exercise anorexic, which is where you exercise so much so that you can binge and whatnot. And that's the primary reason why you exercise um, and to keep your body weight as low as possible. Um, you know, darn the health consequences, but that you should make good choices. So maybe for a, a birthday, when you're making a cake, make a protein brownie instead, or instead of serving ice cream, make something with a ninja creamy, like we have been so often lately. Um, that way you can still be a food enthusiast as I am, um, and maintain your good health. Yeah. I think those are all perfectly reasonable options. Don't know that there'll be much here at the end. But we'll see what he has to say. Your life. Being able to eat lower calorie foods while keeping yourself full. Even Sam Zulik said this in his last video. If you want to lose weight, you need to eat lower calorie portions that keep you full. If you have two bowl options, one has a lot of calories, one has a little bit of calories. If you eat the one with less calories and it makes you full, you're going to have an easier time to lose weight. It really is that simple. That is why the cookbook works so well. You get Except that it's not that simple. It, the physics is that simple. But the habit change is not that simple. Um, most people know that there are laws of thermodynamics and calories in must equal calories out. However, a lot of individuals that try to eat these 200, 300 calorie breakfasts and lunch, um, what we see in clinical practice is that very commonly the last three or four hours of the day, the, they are so hungry they're hangry, they're irritable, they're orexigenic. Again, mm. thinking about the anorexigenic center of the hypothalamus versus the orexigenic center, they're hungry, they're angry, and they're awake. And they eat partly because it helps them go to sleep. They feel tired after they eat. And also um, they're more likely to binge after maybe the, the kids are in bed. Um, this is when I do like to make my Ninja Creamy. Um, and that helps me stave off some of the desire to do late night snacking or just overeat for dinner. But the moral of the story here is if you're, especially if you're training, um, don't try to consume, um, a, you know, a very low percentage of your calories if it's going to put you at risk of binging later. Yes, some people have great luck with intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding, but um, know what category you're in. Just because somebody else has success with time restricted feeding doesn't mean it's a good option for you if you're going to not be able to learn to enjoy adhering to it. Yeah, and vice versa, if you're someone who eats your two meals a day and you've stayed in great shape this way, um, they've actually done some studies with habitual breakfast skippers and they just said, hey, just start eating breakfast and those people start gaining weight. So yep. it is very individual. And sort of these are people that had always been skipping breakfast and then now the net result is they're just getting in more calories and of course they gain weight. So it doesn't seem like that offset their normal calorie intake, but totally agree. I think the window, like I would say at least two thirds of patients I talk to, I say, hey, what's your problem meal or problem time of day? It's not breakfast. Uh, sometimes it's snacking or lunch at the office, that sort of thing. But most of the time they say, yo, yeah, it's dinner or after dinner. I just can't stop eating. Yeah. And that's a, a good example. We said the individualized word again. Um, <laughs> Because at the end yeah. of the day, there are strategies that can help everyone. That's part of why the false dichotomy of it's either calories in, calories out, or I suppose it's not your fault, health at any body composition. But that's why that um, dichotomy is so polarizing and people like to uh, look at memes from various influencers. And Greg does give a lot of tips and he does have a lot of great recipes. Again, um, I've noted many times on podcasts that I lost quite a bit of weight during residency and some of the recipes that I followed was Greg's protein ice cream, 
Um, now that Ninja has a creamy, it's even better than the old school way that you made it in the Ninja. But um, taking those tips away is what you should concentrate on. Um, yes, calories in equals calories out, but honestly, we um, shouldn't even concentrate on that. Instead, we can look at foods of low caloric density um, for the right person tracking calories and what tools you can learn to learn those habits. Yeah, I think that's really reasonable. The framework I tend to start with is, you know, hey, are you someone who just wants to very meticulously track things and then do the same things day in and day out? Or do you want to have sort of a slightly looser set of rules and, you know, pick the foods that you can eat the most of and have the least calories? Generally, those are going to be higher in nutritional value as well. So there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, and now I suppose we should switch over and talk about how we're going to solve this problem in the United States. Yeah. Um, Let's just pull up some charts here. So as people know, we love charts and graphs, especially if they have to do with maps. Uh, we're geography enthusiasts. But this is one that tells you how various items are taxed in your state. As people know, we're from Kansas City, the Kansas side of Kansas City. So it's good to see that green color there, but there's a lot of red. Uh, the green color there means we have to pay taxes on regular groceries. People in Missouri, so if I drive you know, 30 minutes east, I can go get my groceries and pay less tax on them. Mm -hmm. And you can see in both Kansas and Missouri, they don't exclude, well, Kansas doesn't matter because candy's going to get taxed just the same. Yep. But some states, uh, particularly I'm looking at Georgia here, Louisiana, uh, I don't know if they call this the fat belt, um, but yep. those two states, they groceries are fully tax exempt and there's no distinction between groceries and candy, and candy. or soda. Yep. So you go buy a two liter of orange soda at the grocery store. You don't pay any taxes on it. It's just like your normal groceries. So some states, you can see by these purple and blue dots, some states have exempted those that, hey, mm -hmm. these are exclusionary. So like if you're in Florida, yeah, you can go and you don't pay taxes on your groceries. But if you're going to buy a two liter of soda or a candy bar, then you're going to have to pay taxes on those. So this is sort of like the, the fat tax that we already have or a, a sin tax that's sometimes referred to just like applies to nicotine products or alcohol or gasoline. If you live in California, they believe yep. driving is a sin. Yeah. Um, if enough states adopted those exemptions, which it looks like quite a few of them have, then it's only a matter of time until companies get very, um, you know, uh, astute at what they are defining their product as. Like a cliff bar, is that candy? Yeah, I think that companies and industry in general will always be one step ahead of the regulations yep. because they they exist to make a profit. They're good at making money. So that's why Japan went a step ahead of the companies and said, hey, if you have any fat employees, we're going to tax you. They beat the companies at their own game. Yeah, um, it is a very interesting idea rather than having all these exemptions and then, uh, you know, companies have lobbyists in certain states. I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of lobbyists in Texas and California. So it's interesting to see that they have slightly different laws. Um, but uh, in general, when you make a whole bunch of exemptions for taxing, people just find a way to get around it. Some people drive from Kansas to Missouri to get gas, since gas is also taxed less in Missouri. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And looking at like this is not just an exemption, right? Like, hey, you can't not pay taxes on this, but an additional tax. And if you look at, looks like Boulder, I assume this is Colorado, two cents per ounce on soda. So it's a soda tax and this varies from, it's like one cent per ounce in some places in California. And then the highest is that two cents in Boulder, Colorado. And I, I never thought I would say this sentence, but the taxes aren't high enough. <laughs> two cents per ounce, a two liter soda, that's going to be yeah. like a dollar thirty more. Yeah. That's not going to deter anyone. Yeah. Make it like, what, 20 cents per ounce? What well, the reason it? they have these taxes is just so the politician can say they did something. Yeah. But they're if, not actually, they don't actually care if they work. But when people start looking at a bottle of soda, so this is a orange soda, since we've yeah. been saying orange soda, you look at that bottle of orange soda and all sugary goodness. You should look at that like a fine bottle of wine. Like, ooh, this is going to cost me a hundred bucks. 
Better save it for a special occasion. I can't just splurge on this and have it every single day. That makes sense. Unless it's my Gorilla Mind Orange Crush energy drink. That's completely different. Because it doesn't have sugar content. Just artificial sugars. Yeah. Artificial sugars are completely <laughs> benign. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that for a different podcast. I think we've done a, we have done a podcast on artificial sugars before. Yeah, we have. Yep. Yeah. And looking at the motor fuel rates, this was my reference to California. So they have a tax that is, at the time of this, I think this was a 2010s article, 62.9 cents per gallon which is over three times as high as some areas. So sins vary from culture to culture. Mm -hmm. And in the culture of California, they believe that internal combustion engines are a sin. Because the hybrid lobby is strong. Yeah. Okay, that's no surprise. And then, oh yeah, speaking of Japan again, where this law, the Metabo law that we just discussed, uh, their most popular film of all time is called Spirited Away. And I had never heard of this until this morning when we were researching some things prior to doing this reaction video. And apparently is it a story about a young girl and her parents who go to explore an amusement park that is deserted. And then the parents uh, happen upon uh, this, I guess it's a buffet, that's what it looks like. And they start eating the food without permission and they keep eating and keep eating, and keep eating until they become pigs. So what is the moral of the story here? Uh, according to reviews, apparently the moral is not clear and we're not sure and we need to decide for ourselves. But this certainly seems like a, uh, I guess, cultural pushback against trends toward obesity. Again, for uh, better or for worse, from a public health standpoint for the better, but perhaps from a, um, a ink, inclusion standpoint for the worse, maybe. Um, there is a lot of success in preventing obesity in Japan. Japan also has a, a uh, I think it's called a monoculture, where many most uh, people that live in Japan have share similar values and similar goals. And not being obese is definitely one of those goals. Um, now, uh, it's kind of unclear if they're doing this for the right reason. Perhaps they just want to be accepted in the culture, but if even if they're doing it for the wrong reason, it will bring some health benefit to that culture. Yeah, certainly health outcomes and lifespans much better there. Um, thinking about the movie, I mean, there's wide ranging interpretations. Some people say this is a reference to ancient Rome and that there's mythology components to it. Some people say it was specifically about people who were greedy during a Japanese recession. And then other people will say, hey, this is just a propaganda piece to influence children because it's an animated film and we want to instill that very early so that kids are you know, frightened of over consuming food. So yeah. I could see that if you're a young impressionable child and you're watching this movie, you think, oh my goodness, if I eat a lot of food, I'm going to turn into a pig. Yeah, um, it's a very interesting concept. Gluttony is also discussed in ancient times, including in the Bible. But as many people know, um, it's calories in, calories out, as everyone knows at this point. So a lot of individuals who are obese, they have become obese over a long period of time, and they have very low lean body mass. They are not active whatsoever. And from a standpoint of how much um, they eat versus how much a lot of individuals eat, including myself, they actually don't eat a lot of food. They just don't burn many yeah, calories. They may have some people, if they are that, you know, under muscle, the phenotype, they're over fat, but normal BMI, skinny fat, sometimes it's called, then yep. yeah, they can absolutely be in a situation where, hey, I'm eating, you know, 1600 calories a day, and I'm not losing weight. You know, that may very well be the case if they only have 80 pounds of lean body mass. Yep. Um, again, if somebody is listening and they're wondering, um, am I skinny fat? Do I need to lose weight? Do I need to gain weight? Um, when I was 22, I fit in these clothes and maybe I need to fit in those same clothes now that I'm uh, 32 or with 42. With three kids. Yeah, with yeah. three kids. Anyway, uh, that's uh, pet peeves of mine that um, don't need to discuss. But uh, again, going back to body composition, 
A healthy range for most females is about 20 to 33% on a DEXA. And yes, I've seen variations between DEXAs and in bodies up to 10%. Um, so there can be quite a bit of variation. DEXA, it seems, usually says you have a slightly higher body fat percentage. So if you're an individual who you know you're going to have, have a healthy body fat percentage, but you just want to have a low number for whatever reason, maybe flex on your friends, <laughs> um, then maybe do a biometric scan at your gym or do an in body and then avoid the DEXA. But the DEXA does have bone density. It does have fat free mass. It also has the visceral adipose. So it, it does seem objectively superior in my degree. Greg Doucette would also tell us DEXA is not the gold standard. DEXA is kind of considered um, the best that we regularly do. Nobody really gets MRIs for body composition. Yeah, I mean, even a DEXA for like 300 million Americans would be a ridiculous ask, let alone yeah. an MRI to see what someone's body composition looks like. For that reason, the BMI is still in favor. Waist circumference adds another level of detail there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't mention males, I guess. Uh, for males, 7% to about 18 or 20% is a healthy body fat percentage for males. Yeah, and I actually think that some companies here in the United States on their own accord have come up with an initiative that is, you know, kind of contrasts with what Japan has done. So Japan, they had this film that was produced that's really discouraging, um, you know, overeating, overconsuming, or gluttony. And then we've had a number of companies that have come out with plus size mannequins to try to combat this problem. Ah, uh, to try to combat the problem? Yes. <laughs> All right. They're putting um, it everywhere so people see it and they know it's a problem. Hmm. Uh, some people just don't think about it. They're like, mannequins are the same size they've always been. Obesity must not be an issue. But yeah. now you see it, you go into the store and people are like, wow, maybe we need to start taking this seriously. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the intended effect, but that's a, a good idea there. <laughs> um, I thought that you were going to go to the direction of companies that provide free gym memberships like our company oh, does. Oh, that's what we do. Yeah, that yeah. is what we do. That's a good initiative. Or that incentivizes individuals via various competitions to improve their body composition with, um, without any regard to body weight or whatnot, um, or just to frequently attend, uh, go to a gym frequently. And if you go past a certain degree, then there's an incentive for that as well. So there's a lot of positive incentives rather than negative incentives that businesses can and should um, do on their own. Uh, some businesses sign up everyone for our direct primary care or for individualized medicine. So there's a lot of ways to invest in the health and body composition is certainly part of health of your employees. Absolutely. And I don't know that we have anything else to add here. I think this is a pretty good summary. So I guess closing thoughts, um, interesting to compare and contrast are two very different cultures. Uh, I think there's lessons that can be learned in either side, because when you have such an extreme culture of like acceptance of greed and gluttony, overeating, and a culture that has such a like distaste for that, then you are going to have outliers that are affected negatively in each case. Yeah. Um, and as we often say, in general, there is health at most sizes, but there is certainly not health at any body composition. So if you're an individual that is kind of on this, um, you know, you have your gym bro side of the community that thinks everyone should be shredded and that everyone's just lazy. That is not have, that doesn't having have a, a, having a shredded a physique. Having a fat-free mass index of under 25 is a <laughs> sin. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then on this other side, health at any size, if you tend to be more towards this side, and I think as I age, I'm slightly more towards this side, but with a skew, it's not health at any body composition. It's health at most sizes. There's a lot of females that weigh more than 200 pounds, and there's a lot of males that weigh around 250 pounds that have good body composition and excellent overall health. Now, there's not a lot of people like that, but there certainly is a uh, a significant portion of individuals that are in that category. And um, if you think would, you're one of those people, head over to our website, get a self-service yeah. lab panel so that you can prove it by yeah. showing everyone how good your metabolic health is. Prove it with an advanced male panel or an advanced female, female panel. One more caveat to that. Um, if you are not natural, then this health at any size at good body composition does not apply. Yeah. We, we chatted about that. That'll be a fun one to do in the future as well. Yep. So I think that's a pretty good summary. Our closing thoughts, 
If you have a solution to the overweight and obesity crisis, please leave it below in the comments. We would love to read through those. Maybe we react to those comments for our mm -hmm. next video. As always, thank you for your time. Uh, we hope that this has taught you some good tools to develop a balanced approach for health and may God give you health and happiness. <music>